Hi there! As you probably know, uh, being a pretty new user of Julia, I'm still learning the language and getting to appreciate more and more its fascinating features along the way. In this video, I would like to share with you a small experiment I did using Julia for a pretty common data transformation in machine learning and statistics, namely z-score normalization. Also, instead of z-score normalization, you might come across the term standardization in statistics or feature normalization in the context of machine learning. Firstly, I will very briefly go through the reasons why this data transformation process is valued so much, especially in the context of machine learning. Then, I will simply outline how I use Julia in two different ways to actually do the z-score transformation. So, the first choice you have for doing z-score normalization with Julia is to use the stats-based built-in functions fit and transform. The second choice is to prepare your own functions. For example, what I did is to actually create three short functions, my standardize, my standardize2 and a mutating version of my standardize as an exercise for learning the language. In this video, not only will I demonstrate both functions, but I will also time and compare the alternatives, the three functions I just mentioned, and stats bases, uh, fit and transform functions, by using benchmark tools. Benchmark tools is the most well-known package in Julia that executes one or more lines of code, respectively, a big number of times, and uh, returns some interesting indices related to the performance of your program execution, as you will see in a minute. Then, to be as fair as possible uh, while comparing the different functions, I thought I should use the array of timings stored in a benchmark object for conducting a two-sample independent t-test. Finally, to be even more accurate with respect to the effect size of the differences in timings, I also measured the Cohen's D index for evaluating the effect size of the t-tests so that I can make sure that any statistical significance that may appear in the t-tests is also powerful enough to take it seriously into account. Now, as the methods that timing experiments of this kind are usually assessed are uh, out of the scope of my expertise, since I'm not a developer, I would very much appreciate if you shared alternatives on assessing performance timings and any thoughts or experience on, on how you compare benchmarks output. Let's take first things first. I created this short Pluto notebook. I have to admit that I am fascinated by the feature of this type of notebook. And by the way, if any of the Pluto's creators ever listens to this video, I feel the need to thank them for creating and maintaining it. It's an environment with fantastic features. Anyways, um, I will write the link to a recent talk from one of Pluto's creators in the description below the video. I have also uploaded the Pluto notebook uh, that I had prepared for this video on my GitHub account. It's also written on the video description below. Coming back to normalization. The goal of normalization is to assign equal importance to all the features of the data. There are different kinds of normalization, the most common of which is the z-score normalization. And here is the formula that transforms your data into z-scores. What happens here is that all data points are expressed in terms of the number of standard deviations they are away from the mean. Each data point's distance from the mean is now translated into standard deviations distance from the mean. Although regressions coefficients are insensitive to standardization, meaning that since this type of data transformation is simply a kind of linear transformation, it leaves them unaffected, the training of regression models is affected by the difference in the scale of the data. The reason is that since the data matrix is actively taking part in the gradient descent update rule, the value of any feature determines the update rate. If the feature with the greatest scale is of large values, uh, the update steps will be large as well, and that will influence the effectiveness of the algorithm. The execution of the algorithm will delay, since it will possibly be moving back and forth before it hits the right spot, where the optimal values of the parameters are actually situated. Uh, 
For distance-based methods, such as clustering with the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, for instance, the notion of distance is critical. Different scales of values do not reliably reflect the real distance between the data. But by normalizing the data, each feature will be assigned equal importance and the distance will be measured in fair terms. Let's move on now to the sections with the code cells. There are a couple of things going on in this section. First of all, I define the function statsbase standardize that accepts an array of type float64 and returns a new array called normal, whose values are standardized values of the array argument m. Starting from the inside out, the three lines in the middle do the actual data normalization. First, the function fit does the actual job of normalizing the data by taking an array and making an object of type z-score transform out of it. The fit function is a generic function that maps to a series of methods for transforming the data in various ways, including z-score normalization. Then, the transform function converts the resulting z-score transform object back to an array of the actual values. I wrapped up the relevant code chunk within a function called statsbase standardize so that I could assess the execution time of normalizing an array with a benchmark macro provided by the benchmark tools package. The array tested with statsbase standardize is a 2 by 3 matrix uh, with values uh, close to 0 as you can see. Using the benchmark macro, the function uh, is called 10,000 times and the mean execution time is 1.14 milliseconds. The output includes some other interesting descriptive statistics such as the minimum and the maximum time that range from 834.579 uh, nanoseconds to 54.042 milliseconds and some estimate of the allocated memory, namely 1.4 kilobits. If I run the code cell one more time, you can see that the times will uh, slightly change uh, due to sampling variation. Now, let's move on to the next sections with the functions that I created, serving as an alternative to the function statsbase standardize. First of all, let's make sure that the code actually does the data normalization that is supposed to do by checking its output. Yes, it works. Now, uh, what it does is that it standardizes uh, each data point by looping through each element of the array normal. It goes through each row and then through each column. The meat of the transformation is this highlighted part whereby each cell is subtracted from the mean and then divided by the sample standard deviation. Next step is to wrap up the code into the function myStandardize uh, so that we can time its execution with a benchmark macro. As you can see, overall the times are much better compared to those of the statsbase uh, functions. Uh, there are two points to stress now. The first is that uh, loops are very fast. The second is that the reason why stats-based functions are a bit slower may be related to the fact that uh, the fit and transform functions are generic uh, functions and probably many methods implement them. So that could be a way to explain the difference. Uh, why don't we go and check out uh, how many methods are attached to these functions. Let me go to the relevant section for keeping the notebook organized. Using the methods function, uh, you can see that there are 24 methods uh, attached to fit. And two methods attached to transform. If there is anything else you can think that causes uh, this difference in timings, uh, please drop a comment on the description below. I would be eager to learn something new about the internals of the language. In the next section of the notebook, I define an almost identical function called my standardized 2. 
It differs to my standardize only with respect to the initialization of the empty matrix that will be populated with the standardized values. So the array normal 3 here is initialized with a similar function that creates a new array with the same dimensionality as its argument. The reason why I created this function is to see whether there is any performance difference when choosing to initialize arrays in two different ways. As you can see, the timings of my standardized array init and my standardized similar are almost identical. Lastly, I benchmark a mutating version of the previous functions, whereby what is interesting is that the standardized values are stored in situ, meaning that the transformation takes place in the same array, m. By benchmarking the mutating function, my standardized in situ, I find out the difference that it would make when no memory is allocated for a new array. As expected, the timings are much better as you can see and there is one allocation less. Now, as I said in the beginning of the video, to be totally fair, I thought I should contact t-tests to compare the timings. So I did three, two sample independent t-tests with a package uh, hypothesis tests. But to do these tests, you need to retrieve the array of timings as these are recorded by the benchmark macro and stored in the cells above. To access these timings, you simply need to use the dot operator and retrieves the times field of these stored benchmark objects. The first test compares the means of the timings in the stats base standardize and my standardize uh, array init benchmark objects. As you can see, the two-sided p-value is extremely low, which means that there is indeed a statistically significant difference between the means of the two arrays of timings. The second t-test between the first two functions that I created shows again a statistically significant difference between their two arrays of timings. The last t-test between the timings of my standardized array in it and my standardized in situ indicates that there is a statistically significant difference between these two arrays of timings too. However, the size of, of the timings array is large enough, 10,000, to raise concerns as to whether the statistically significant differences are due to the sample size and not to the real difference between the two sets of timings. That is why one needs to assess the real effect size of the difference. Coins D is an index that compensates for the sample size and essentially ignores it and assesses the real effect size of the differences. I cite the relevant formulas for reference purposes, but the analysis could be the subject of a separate video. The rule of thumb for interpreting the importance of the index is shown here. Effect size between 0.2 and 0.5 is considered small, from 0.5 through 0.8 is considered medium, and 0.8 through 1, large. Now, to calculate coins D in Julia, I use the coin D function of the effect sizes package. As you can see, although the t-tests had significant results, the coin D for all three pairs of timings arrays indicates a small to medium effect size for the difference between them. That's all for now. I hope you found this small experiment interesting and see you in the next video.